So Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So for the, for the stretch of this week, what we are attempting to do is how to establish a personal altar. Now the efforts of this week is tied to a statement drawn from Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. For he that cometh to God, for he that cometh to God. You will find out that in the Garden of Eden, God came to man. But man had no means of going to God. Part of the reason why Adam could not access God was because at the time he did not have the life of God. He could not trade in God's unique space. He was innocent, but he was not righteous. Lacking in the life of God made it impossible for him to deal with God. So the kind of encounters that were possible in the regime of the Garden of Eden was a one-way encounter. It was God that came to man in the garden in the cool of the day. But we are seeing something here, a new addition, a new addition to the possibility. And that addition is on the account of our redemption. We now have the capacity, we now have the equipment to be able to come to God. Hallelujah. Okay. Now that we want to begin to come to God, we want to establish an altar. I would like to draw a few points to us on how to commence that adventure. All right, let's begin from the book of Numbers, chapter 30, and I'll read verse 1 and verse 2. Are you with me? Now, we are going on a long journey, and I'd like you to pay attention. Going on a long journey. I'd like you to pay attention. Amen. Hallelujah. Numbers, chapter 30, verse number 1. And Moses spake unto the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord had commanded. Now, so what we are reading now is a direct instruction, a direct command from God. And you will come to realize as we read verse 2 that the commandment has to do with making a mark in God's realm. He said, if a man vow a vow unto the Lord or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeded out of his mouth. You know, have you read that, Bible, that scripture, that part of the Bible, that passage of the Bible that says that God is not a man that he should lie, that the words of God will not return unto him void, but it will prosper. In that thing whereunto it is sent, it will bring to pass the purpose for which it was sent. That's the nature of the word of God. That's the nature of the God we serve. It's a God that is faithful, a God that means what he says, a God that says what he means. Are you there? Part of the evidence that you are beginning to mature in the ways of God is that you begin to look like God. And what part of the implication of that is that when you say something, you will not violate it. Because that's not the nature of your father. And I need to show you a particular matter here. There's a matter. How many of you still remember when I taught on how to move the hand of God? I know you don't remember what I teach you. How to move the hand of God. And I showed you scenarios in scripture where people compelled God to act on their behalf. I showed you things like the oath of silence that was used around the wall of Jericho. That people decided to keep quiet. And they walk around the wall one time, they did that the second day, did that the third day, did that the fourth day, and on the seventh day they were silent and they walk around the wall seven times bearing the oath of silence. When they now shouted after keeping quiet for so many days, the wall of Jericho that was built in form of a cuboid, it fell before them and they discomfited the city. The engineers that built the world walls were military engineers and the walls were built in such a manner that it is impossible for those walls to be breached. Then the instruction that led to the moving of God's hand to make an impossible situation possible 
required an oath of silence. Sister, is there any day you woke up and you didn't speak until the sun went down? I'm talking to you, sister. You. Was there any day in your life that you woke up and you didn't talk until the, the sun went down? You don't need to stand up. Just respond from yourself. It, it has never happened. So there are dimensions of power that you will not be able to handle if you are not disciplined enough to. I went to my father in the Lord many years ago and I asked him, I noticed that you are one of the most sensitive Christians that I've seen. What is your secret? He said, stop talking too much. Stop talking. <laughs> Keep quiet. That he can take a trip from Zaria, where he is, to Lokoja, where he wants to go preach. And the driver knows they will not have a discussion until they arrive. So by the time he comes to the pulpit and he greets you, hallelujah, hallelujah, some angels are already at work because he, he greeted you. So I spoke about the oath of silence and, uh, as a means of capturing your spiritual energy, gathering it from everywhere it is, so that when you now speak as you are commanded, not empty talk, not useless talk, you now speak as you are commanded, God will back it up. The second point I raised was the issue of the vow. The issue of a vow. And the one that has to do with the matter that we are raising here today is this second issue, the issue of the vow. God is saying that when you make a vow, do not withdraw your utterance. Labor to see that you fulfill it. Are you there? Uh -huh. The first thing that is required, in order for you to set up a personal altar, is a human attendant that is ready, is avowed, to deal with God. He makes a commitment that he cannot withdraw to deal with God. I'm still checking my spirit to see if I should go to Leviticus chapter 27. In Leviticus chapter 27, I can produce a chart from the Bible that gives us the value when a man comes and makes a vow of himself before God. That chart gives us a value of the the price tag or the consequence of that vow before the presence of God. So it gives us an idea to be able to evaluate the implication of that vow before the presence of God. Am I making sense? Now, so I want to show you a chart. I'm not sure I'm supposed to show you yet, but it is my intention so to do. Then if I show you this chart, I will discover that when, what's your name? Joseph, when brother Joseph comes into the presence of God and makes a vow, the, the realm of God will scan him. And then the spiritual implication of your vow will be articulated in the realm of the spirit. And the value is going to be different from the value that will be obtainable if he makes a vow. If she makes a vow. Are you there? Now, so I want to show you a chart. Maybe the chat will encourage us. Maybe the chat will give us an idea. The moment you get that idea, you'll be able to flow with me on the journey that I intend to embark upon. Let's do Leviticus chapter 27 quickly. Leviticus chapter 27. That's the last chapter of the book of Leviticus. Are you there? And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying... Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When a man shall make a singular vow, the persons shall be for the Lord by thy estimation. Please stop there, stop there, stop there. Let me explain what we are doing here so that you will not run into crisis. Like I said to us, we just read from the book of Leviticus chapter 27. Is that true? And if you notice, chapter 27 is the last chapter of the book of Leviticus. Is that true? And the next book, after the book of Leviticus, is the book of Numbers. Is that true? Good. I will explain the reason why I made all these statements as we journey in this matter. 